Hey guys, today we're going to be talking about metabolic syndrome. First, let's talk about the definition of metabolic syndrome. There are several definitions. Most of them have several parameters, but it is important to know the differences. NCEP ATP3 takes into consideration the following. It has to have at least three or more of fasting glucose of more than 100 mg per deciliter or drug treatment for hyperglycemia, less than 40 mg per deciliter of HCL for men and 50 mg per deciliter of HCL for women or drug treatment for low HDL, more than 150 mg per deciliter of triglycerides or drug treatment for elevated triglycerides. Also, in regards to waist circumference, men have to have at least 102 centimeters or more of waist circumference and women at least 88 centimeters of waist circumference. For blood pressure, the cutoff value is 130 over 85 millimeters of mercury or drug treatment for hypertension. Meanwhile, the IDF considers these parameters. At least three of the following, fasting glucose of more than 100 milligrams per deciliter or diagnosed diabetes, less than 40 milligrams per deciliter of HDL for men or 50 milligrams per deciliter for women or drug treatment for low HDL, more than 150 milligrams per deciliter of triglycerides or drug treatment for elevated triglycerides, more than 94 centimeters of waist circumference for men or more than 80 centimeters for women, and more than 130 over 85 millimeters of, of mercury or drug treatment for hypertension regarding blood pressure. The EGIR has a required parameter that it's insulin resistance or fasting hyperinsulinemia and two or more of the following, fasting glucose of of 100 to 125 milligrams per deciliter, less than 40 milligrams per deciliter of HDL, more than 180 milligrams per deciliter of triglycerides or a drug treatment for dyslipidemia, more than 94 centimeters for waist and conference of, for men or more than 80 centimeters for women, and more than 140 over 90 for blood pressure or drug treatment for hypertension. The WHO also has a required parameter that's insulin resistance in top 25%, or fasting glucose of more than 110 milligrams per deciliter, or two-hour glucose of more than 140 milligrams per deciliter, and two of the following, less than 35 milligrams per deciliter of HDL for men, or less than 40 milligrams per deciliter for women, more than 150 milligrams per deciliter of triglycerides, waist-hip ratio of more than 0.9 for men, or more than 0.85 for women, or BMI more than 30 kilograms per meter squared. Also, for blood pressure, it's more than 140 per 90 millimeters of mercury. The AACE also has a required parameter of high risk of insulin res resistance or BMI of more than 25 kilograms per meter squared or waist circumference of more than 102 centimeters for men or 88 centimeters for women. And two of the following, fasting glucose of more than 100 milligrams per deciliter or two-hour glucose of more than 140 milligrams per deciliter. Also, NHCL of less than 40 for men and 50 for women, triglycerides of more than 150 milligrams per deciliter, and blood pressure above 130 over 85. It is important to know that there are a few differences regarding weight circumference for different ethnicities. People from Asian, Central, and South America have a lower cutoff value compared to the standard, 90 centimeters for men and 80 centi centimeters for women. For people from Europe, the Middle East, and Sub-Saharan Africa, the cutoff for men is a little bit higher at 95 centi centimeters, but for women it remains the same at 80 centimeters. So let's talk about how someone gets to metabolic syndrome. Firstly, it has to be an increased caloric intake accompanied by decreased physical activity. This increases visceral adiposity and then things start to change. Adipokines are modified, leptin is increased, and adiponectin is decreased. Angiotensin 2, TNF, IL-6, CRP, fibrinogen, and free fatty acids all increase. The changes in adipokines lead to neurohumoral activation, while the increase in angiotensin 2 leads to an increase in reactive oxygen species and lipooxygenase activation, as well as renin angiotensin aldosterone system activation. The activation of the pro-inflammatory markers are also leading to RAS activation. Free fatty acids contribute to decreased insulin secretion by the pancreas and thus decreased glucose intake by target organs, as well as increasing gluconeogenesis, lipogenesis, and triglycerides. The consequences of activation of all of these pathways is chronic inflammation and insulin resistance, resulting in metabolic syndrome. Now, to summarize what we just said, a simplified way of seeing this is that obesity will, call the, will cause the following. Insulin resistance, vascular endothelial dysfunction, abnormal lipid profile, hypertension, and vascular inflammation. 
All of these lead to cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. There are also inflammatory and prothrombic markers that are associated with an increased risk for subsequent cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes mellitus. These markers have been proposed to serve as a reference for cardiovascular and type 2 diabetes risk, but are still not used universally. These include C-reactive protein, IL-6, and plasminogen activator inhibitor 1. The prevalence of metabolic syndrome rises as people get older, with its highest prevalence at ages 60 to 69. It is also more common in Mexican-Americans when compared to other ethnicities. There are many risk factors that can predispose a patient to metabolic syndrome. Some of these were already mentioned before. They include increased body rate, race, ethnicity, age, smoking, postmenopausal st status, physical inactivity, low household income, and high carb diet. The two major clinical implications in metabolic syndrome are the risk of type 2 diabetes, in which obese people with metabolic syndrome have a tenfold increased risk, and the risk of cardiovascular disease. Patients with metabolic syndrome are twice as likely to suffer from cardiovascular disease than the general population. Insulin resistance is also associated with high blood pressure, hypertriglyceridemia, and low HDL. Other important associations include fatty liver disease, liver fibrosis, cirrhosis, hepatocellular carcinoma, cholangiocarcinoma, chronic kidney disease, polycystic ovarian syndrome, obstructive sleep apnea, hyperuricemia, gout, and increased risk of cognitive decline and dementia. So, what about therapy? There are two main goals in metabolic syndrome therapy. Treating the underlying causes by intensifying weight management and increasing physical activity, and also treating cardiovascular risk factors if they persist despite lifestyle modification. So, diving direct directly into specifics, let's start with lifestyle modifications. These are focused on weight reduction and increased physical activity to prevent progression of metabolic syndrome. It is recommended that patients adopt a Mediterranean diet high in fruits, vegetables, nuts, whole grains, and olive oil, with a low-fat, low-salt diet limited to 2,400 milligrams of sodium per day. Exercise for a daily minimum of 30 minutes of moderate intensity. Lifestyle modifications reduce the risk of type 2 diabetes and the use of oral hypoglycemic agents such as metformin can prevent or delay the development of diabetes. Cardiovascular risk reduction can be achieved by reversal of the metabolic syndrome. It is also recommended to ma maintain an LDL cholesterol of less than 100 and hypertension control is important, especially in patients with diabetes. And that's about it for metabolic syndrome. I hope you learned something today and thanks for watching. <music>